Hello, everyone, and welcome to Virtual Planetarium Exploring Space, part of our MOS at Home programming. My name is Janine, my pronouns are she and her, and I'll be your moderator today. That means I'll be reading some of your questions and responses, which you can submit below using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen here in the Zoom meeting. If you'd like to see captions during today's program, you can click Close Captions button at the bottom of your screen and select Show Subtitles. And if you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube, hello! Welcome, we're so excited to have you here today. Unfortunately, I'm unable to see your comments on either of those platforms at this time. We're so delighted to have all of you here today for our audience. Um, let's meet our flight crew for this journey through space. Flight crew, I like that. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Talia. I use she, her pronouns, and I am going to be your presenter today, but I cannot do this alone. Hi, everyone. My name is Katie. My pronouns are she and her, and today I'm going to be your pilot flying you through space. So today we're going to, I'm going to try something a little bit different. We are going to be talking about space, but space is not going to be our focus. What we're going to be focusing on today is time. Space and time are actually very closely connected. So Katie, let's go ahead and head out into space. Um, so we, as we get started, we're going to be taking a look, starting off here, looking at our own solar system from above. And I wanted to talk about time because um, astronomers have a very interesting relationship with time compared to pretty much everybody else. Um, because for a few different reasons, and the first one I'm gonna talk about is time scales. The time scales that astronomers are working with are different from the time scales that any other science works with and certainly different than the time scales that any everyday person works with. And your everyday person um, might think of things in terms of uh, decades or centuries, possibly millennia, um, thousands of years, you know, just in terms of that's really the length of time that we can say belongs to human civilization. Um, but when you get into some of the sciences, the time scales get bigger. So, you know, got paleontology, things like looking at dinosaurs, dinosaur fossils going back hundreds of millions of years. Geology, the study of the earth itself goes back billions of years because earth itself is about four and a half billion years old. And so are the other planets of the solar system. But that's about it for every other science. That's about as old as it's gonna get because before four and a half billion years ago, the earth itself did not exist. But astronomy of course is interested in things beyond earth itself, including things like our sun. Our sun is older than the earth, not by a lot in terms of how astronomers measure time. It's only about 5 billion years old. So not that much older than the earth or the rest of the solar system, but it did come first. So right there, just, you know, thinking about the birth of the solar system, you're talking about a few billion years, up to five billion years ago. So that's already a time scale that you're not really dealing with anywhere else. And that's really just our solar system. So we're going to pull back away from our solar system because, of course, astronomy deals with things outside of our solar system as well. And there's a lot out there that is older than our solar system. So Katie's pulling us away. You can see the orbits of Uranus and Neptune, the outermost planets in our solar system. Because of course, there are other stars out there. Um, we see them when we look up at the night sky and they are all part of something uh, in particular. What are all these stars a part of? Our sun and all the stars around it. What do they all belong to? You can go ahead and put your answer in the Q&A. You may put a question mark if you're not sure what the answer is, because of course, one thing science is very good at is knowing what we don't know. We have an answer coming in. Um, one person says a constellation. Another says Milky Way question mark. Um, Mindy says the galaxy. Yes. So. Um, the Milky Way is our galaxy. It is the galaxy we live inside. And as we look around here, all these stars we're seeing, they're all part of the Milky Way, including our sun and our solar system and all the stars we see in all the constellations and even stars we can't see 
there's a lot of the galaxy that we cannot see from our place in space. So we're going to go ahead and pull back outside of the galaxy because the galaxy is older than our solar system. So I said our solar system is about 5 billion years old, give or take. The Milky Way, we're not completely sure how old the Milky Way is. The guess is somewhere around 10 billion years, maybe older. It's a little bit hard to say when the Milky Way really began. So what Katie is showing us right now is our own galaxy, our Milky Way, of which our sun is a tiny, tiny, insignificant piece. One of about two to 400 billion stars in the galaxy. So you can see astronomers work with billions a lot. Billions is a, 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 a magnitude that gets used a lot in uh, astronomy. So here we have our galaxy, which again, like I said, it's somewhere around 10 million years, could be older than that. We're not completely sure. And it has many generations of stars in side of it. It has a lot of stars that had very short lifespans, lifespans on the order of millions of years. Those are the very biggest stars. Those are the ones that are going to go supernova when they run out of fuel. But there are also a lot of smaller stars out there. And the smaller the star, the longer it lives. So our sun like I said, it's, it's about middle of the road in terms of um, its size and in terms of how long it's going to live. So it's not going to live an excessively long time, but it's not going to have a really short lifespan either. Our sun is going to live about 10 billion years all told. A little longer maybe. Um, and it's about halfway through that. So right there, that's a pretty huge time span that you're dealing with there. 10 billion years. We think it's about how old our galaxy is, and we think it's about how long the sun is going to live. So astronomers throwing around numbers like 10 billion years, that's not weird. It's weird for pretty much anybody else, but not for astronomy. But that's for a star like the sun. There are stars out there way smaller than the sun, and they are going to live even longer. And before I get into those time scales, let's go ahead and add a few more things. Pull farther away from our own galaxy and add a few more galaxies out there. So before we said all of the stars were part of the galaxy. So what Katie's putting up now, all these dots are other galaxies. What are all of the galaxies part of? What thing are all of the galaxies a piece of? Just like our sun is a piece of our galaxy. All these galaxies that Katie's showing you are a piece of what? And remember, you can always put a question mark if you're not sure what the answer is. Yeah, I love that. Questions are the beginning of getting answers. If you don't know what the questions are, how will you get to the answers? Um, we have a answer of a cluster question mark um, and then a couple of universe, some of them with question marks. Most galaxies are a piece of clusters, that's true. Galaxies tend to cluster together. Their gravity pulls them together into groups. But all of the galaxies, all of the galaxy clusters, all of it is all a part of the universe, our universe, um, which is everything that we can see. We call everything that we can see the universe. And it has a starting point. It is not infinitely years old. It is about, we think, 13.8 billion years old. So we think um, the Big Bang, the beginning of our universe, was about 13.8 billion years ago. And which means that's right now the oldest age there is, 13.8 billion years. But again, that's, you know, since the universe began, the universe is still going right? It's still continuing. And so some of those stars, those very, very, very tiny stars, the ones that are burning very slowly and are going to have very long lifespans, some that were born very early in the universe are still burning and are going to burn for a very long time. We think that the smallest stars have lifespans that will last for trillions of years, trillions with a T. 
that is a ridiculous time scale. That is a time scale that the, it's already hard enough to wrap human brains around time scales of billions of years. Trillions of years is even crazier. But we do think that the smallest stars are going to exist for trillions of years. And that the universe itself is going to continue to exist for a number of years that I suppose there's probably a name for. I don't actually know what the name is. It's a lot of zeros. So depending on what astronomers are focusing on, what particular area of space they're focusing on, they may deal with time scales, maybe only on the order of a billion years, could be a few billion years, could be tens of billions of years, could be trillions of years, could be numbers that I don't have a name for. Because these are the sorts of time scales that astronomers work with when we work with learning about space. So that is one way that astronomers have kind of a unique relationship with time. And before I move on, Janine, are there any questions I should try and answer? There are. Molly would like to know, what do the different colors that we're seeing right now mean? Um, different colors indicate a few things. Um, Katie has a few different galaxy surveys up. So some of the colors to tell you what galaxy survey the galaxy is from. And some of the colors tell you how tightly clustered together the galaxies are. So different colors are going to indicate slightly different things because we have a few different data sets up here. Now we have some um, kind of end of time questions, which one is what will happen to the earth in 500 billion years? Will the sun explode? And the other is what is there when the universe isn't there anymore? So in about 5 billion years, the sun is going to swell up into a red supergiant. We think uh, when it does, it's going to swell up and it is going to swallow the earth. So that is probably what's going to happen to the earth. We have 5 billion years, so don't cancel your weekend plans. But uh, we better have a plan B by then. And in terms of what's left when the galaxy is done or when the universe is done, it's uh, nothingness, just emptiness, really. Um, and that's, again, so far into the future, I don't have a word for that number. I'm sure there is one, but I don't know it. But yeah, those are some of the kinds of time scales that astronomers work with, but that's not the only weird way astronomers work with time. Uh, one of the other ways that is kind of unique is that it has to do with the fact that the universe has a speed limit, and that is the speed of light. Nothing can move faster than the speed of light. And the speed of light is not infinite. It has a definite value. It is about 186,000 miles per second. So that is the speed of light. And what that means is that if something is 600 light years away from you, it takes 600 years for the light emitted from that object to travel to your telescope. So if we're looking at a star 600 light years away, we're seeing it not as it is today, but as it looked when it emitted that light 600 years ago. So we're actually seeing what it looked like 600 years ago. We're looking back in time. And again, 600 light years is a short distance. So a light year is the distance that light will travel in a year. And 600 light years is pretty close. It's something, something 600 light years away from us would be like a star we can see in the night sky. That's very close to us. The nearest uh, big galaxy to us, our nearest large neighbor, does anybody happen to know what the name of it is? It's one of the more well-known galaxies out there. Um, so you may have heard its name before. And again, remember, you can always put a question mark. Uh, we have an answer of Andromeda. Andromeda, yeah. So Andromeda is our nearest large neighbor. We have some tiny ones um, that are closer, but it is about two and a half million light years away. So when we look at Andromeda, we're actually seeing the way it looked two and a half million years ago. And that's a relatively nearby galaxy. What Katie is showing us here, this is the visible universe. It is the part of the universe we can see. And that means both objects that have been able to transmit their light to us in the last 13 billion years and things that our telescopes are sensitive enough to detect because the farther light travels, the more diffuse it gets, the harder it is to pick up. That's one of the reasons we like to build bigger and bigger and bigger telescopes. 
because they can see fainter and fainter and fainter light. And that means they can look farther and farther and farther back in time. If they're looking towards, you know, as far out as they can look, you're looking far back in time. So for instance, uh, one of the most famous telescopes out there is the Hubble Space Telescope. It's one of our finest eyes on the sky. It has revolutionized astronomy. And the oldest thing it has ever seen, which means the farthest thing it has ever seen, is a galaxy that came into its seeing about 400 million years after the universe began. So remember, the universe is about 13 billion 800 million years old, 13.8 billion years. This galaxy that uh, Hubble can see, it was when, from when, it's seeing it from when the universe was only about 400 million years old, which means it's seeing it when the universe was very, very, very young. And this is how we learn about what the early universe looks like. We're seeing this galaxy right as it's being born. And, but that's about the edge of what Hubble can do. Hubble is great, but it does have its limitations. And that's why NASA has been working so hard for the last several years to prepare the James Webb Space Telescope, which is gonna be the next big space observatory. It's gonna launch hopefully in 2021, that launch date has slipped several times, so we'll see. But James Webb is bigger than Hubble, and it's designed to look farther than Hubble, maybe as far back as the first hundred million years of the universe's existence. So by looking farther, it's looking even further back in time. And uh, we're hopeful that we're going to get to see not just the first galaxies, which is sort of what Hubble can show us. Hubble can show us out to sort of when the first galaxies are starting to form. We're hoping with James Webb, we might be able to see even as far back as some of the first stars forming and learn about what the universe was like back then. So that's another really weird way that uh, astronomers relate to time. It's when we look at things in space, we're looking at them the way they looked in the past. Astronomy is the only science where you can actively look back and see what things looked like in the past instead of looking at what they look like now, like say looking at dinosaur bones and trying to figure out what they looked like in the past. So Janine, it looks like we might have some questions building up. I can take a few of those before we move on. Yeah, absolutely. Amanda wants to know how many solar systems are in the Milky Way? We don't know how many solar systems. We think it's probably um, roughly as many planets as there are stars. That doesn't mean that every star has a planet because of course like our sun has eight. So that probably means there's like seven other stars out there that don't have any planets because our sun has eight. But uh, we think it probably contains somewhere around 300 billion planets. Oh my goodness, we have existential questions about the universe ending. <laughs> I can so, try. I don't make any guarantees I'll be able to answer them. But so I can... I've been having a conversation with Molly about um, there not being anything when the universe ends. And I was saying, but she said, well, isn't space nothing now? And I said, no, space is full of lots of stuff right now. Um, and so she's wondering, where would the stuff go when the universe ends? It's So it's not that there's nothing. It's more that um, it's kind of like how we think of space being empty now it's not that it's empty it's just that there's so there's so little stuff spread out over such a vast amount of space that it's essentially empty and that is what's basically in store ultimately for the universe is that uh, there will still be atoms atoms will still exist but they're going to be spread over such a vast amount of space that it's essentially like the space is empty because space is actually, the universe is expanding. It's getting bigger all the time, which means all the stuff that's in it is actually spreading out farther and farther and farther apart. And eventually everything's gonna be so spread out that it's basically just gonna be empty space. But again, that's a ridiculous number of years in the future. Um, oh my goodness, so many questions. Uh, Amanda wants to know, why is it dark when you look out? Why can't you see light in space? And that has to do with the fact that as light travels, it's the same amount of light getting spread out over a wider and wider and wider area of space. 
It's the same reason that if you shine a flashlight right in your face, it's really, really bright. But if you take that same flashlight and put it 200 feet away from you, it's much fainter. When an object emits light, that light, as it moves out from its point of origin, spreads out, essentially. And it means it's kind of like if you, you know, if you imagine spreading butter on toast, if you take a, a little piece of toast and put a pat of butter on it, the butter is really, really thick and you can taste it really well. If you were to take that same little pat of butter and try to spread it over a whole loaf of bread, you would have a hard time tasting the butter. So when you are looking at something that's very close to you, the light emitted is nice and bright. It's easy for you to detect. But when things get farther and farther and farther away, the light they emit gets fainter and fainter and fainter and fainter. And there's stuff out there like gas and dust, which obscures that light and gets in the way, which also does not help. And that is why space is dark. All right, I'm gonna throw one final thing at you and then I promise I'll take a few more questions because there's one other weird way that we have to deal with time when we're talking about space. And that is that they're connected. Time and space are not two different things they are part of the same thing. You may have heard the term space-time before. It's very big in sci-fi, but it's a real thing. Space and time are connected and they affect each other. This is essentially what we learn from the theory of relativity. And don't worry, I'm not gonna get too into the weeds here. I'm just gonna sort of cover the basics. Basically, the theory of relativity tells us that what happens to space can affect time or the way we perceive time. You may have uh, heard of special relativity. So special relativity says that if you move fast enough, you experience time differently than someone who's holding still because you're moving through space differently than they are. And this is true even at normal speed. So if I'm holding still and you're in a car, you are technically aging slower than I am. But it's such a tiny effect that we don't notice it. But if you were moving at, say, close to the speed of light, <coughs> you would age a lot slower than me. So let's say you had two twins, one of whom stays on Earth and one who flies out into space close to the speed of light and then comes back. They're no longer going to be the same age. The twin that was moving really fast through space moved slower through time, essentially, aged slower. So they're not going to be the same age anymore. I know this is a crazy, crazy theory, but it turns out that the way you move through space affects the way you perceive time. And that's what special relativity tells us. General relativity does something similar. It tells us that things that affect space can also affect time in terms of gravity. So anywhere where you've got a really powerfully gravitation, powerful gravitational object, time is going to be a little weird in the vicinity of that object. If you've seen the movie Interstellar, that movie dealt with this a lot because a lot of that movie took place close to a black hole. And the characters who were on a planet near the black hole did not age as fast as the people who were left behind on Earth because extreme gravity also affects the way time moves because it affects space. So time turns out to not be quite as absolute as we tend to think of it in everyday life. I mean, it is for those of us who are just plugging away here on earth. But if you're dealing with extreme speeds like the speed of light or extreme gravity, like the gravity around a black hole, time's even weirder. And on that crazy existential note, if I haven't blown your minds already, I'll take a few questions, Janine. <laughs> Sure, here we'll have a more concrete question, which is where is our galaxy on the map that we're showing now? In this map, it's in the middle because it's not because our galaxy is in the middle of the universe, but because this map is a map that we made by looking out in all directions from our point of view here on the earth inside the Milky Way. So from this map, we're in the middle because we're the ones who took the data. Yeah, and I'll also point out that the reason that there's like two cones happening is because that plane of the Milky Way galaxy is blocking our seeing of all of the other stuff. You may remember when we were outside the Milky Way, the Milky Way is shaped like a disc. 
um, we can't really see through the disc. So what you're seeing here is us, we can see very well above the disc and below the disc, but we can't really see through the disc. So these cones are what we can see above and below the disc of the Milky Way. All right. Oh, I like Melissa thinks that plan B for when the, the sun is going to expand and become a red giant is that all the spaceships should push the earth away from the sun. But don't worry, we're going to have better technology then. We better. I mean, we've got five billion years, so we've got time to workshop this. Um, Amanda is asking how many stars there are. So I think we could say how many stars are there in our galaxy? So uh, in our galaxy, we think there's somewhere between 200 and 400 billion. In the universe as a whole, we're not sure, but uh, the number I like to hear is there's more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on all of the beaches on all of the earth. Again, big numbers. Astronomers like to work with big numbers. Jake wants to know, has NASA ever found life in the universe? We have no evidence of there being life in the universe yet. I like to say yet. We keep finding planets out there. There's lots and lots of planets and we keep even finding places in our own solar system that we used to assume would be uninhabitable that maybe wouldn't be some of the moons of uh, Saturn and Jupiter, for instance. So uh, we currently have no evidence of there being life anywhere other than the Earth. But there's so many places out there where life could exist that it seems like statistics is going to, or technology is going to catch up with the statistics sooner or later, I hope. All right, and I'll ask one more question, which is how far is our solar system from the main black hole in the center of the Milky Way galaxy? That is a fascinating question because the answer is different this week than it would have been last week. That's not because our position has changed. It's because we kind of got a better measurement of exactly how far we are. We used to, we're still really far away. We're over 25,000 light years away from it. So like it has no effect on us whatsoever. The supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. We may be uh, closer to it than we thought. We used to think we were about 27,000 light years away, and now we think we're somewhere under 26,000 light years. So we're closer than we thought we were, but not enough to make a difference. It's somewhere around, somewhere over between 25 and 26,000 light years. All right, I think that's time on us. I think we have to call it to the end. So I'll let you guys, thank you so much for taking us on this journey. I'll let you guys all say hi and bye. Bye everybody. I hope I didn't ramble your brains too much with crazy existential stuff. Yeah, I had a fun time in the comments trying to talk about, uh, you know, theoretical astrophysics and cosmology. So um, for those of you who are interested in that, definitely check out Brian Green has a great book on cosmology and how many, um, the universe and the multiverse and all of that. All of that stuff is theoretical. We don't know for sure any of it. So it's just lots of people doing lots of math and trying to figure out what might be possible. Um, Thank you all for joining us today. We hope you had fun and learned something new. Uh, if you did like this, you might like some of our other um, things that we show. You can check that out at mos.org slash mos at home, or you can check out our social media channels. Um, you can also go on YouTube. If you're on YouTube, you can subscribe and anytime we're doing a live stream, it'll pop up and you'll know. Um, if you would like to support more programming like this, you can go to engage.mos.org slash welcome uh, to support more MOS at home programming. And thank you to everyone who has. And this program today was produced using the uh, free software OpenSpace, which you can find at www.openspaceproject.com.